Hi everyone, I'm Doug Gabru. I am the host of this new podcast, Pinpoint History. Some quick background information about me is I'm a university grad, I double majored in history and sociology, I have a huge passion for classics and things history, so instead of bugging the people close to me about it, I decided I would just make a podcast about it. So now I'll bug you, listeners of the world. All right, so you want to know about the podcast. That makes sense. That's why I'm here. So the idea behind Pinpoint History here is to talk about moments in history that I think, out of my purely speculative, I like to just sit and think about history point of view and the impacts they had on the societies that we'll be talking about, the cultures, kingdoms, empires, and what have you. So. My first episode idea I decided on was the Battle of Adrianople in 378, Romans versus the Goths. What happened? How did they get there? The whole point of the podcast is to serve as a conduit of information, I guess, that will give you the context leading up to a moment, the actual moment itself and then the ramifications of those moments. So I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just recording into a mic. So (laughs) however many episodes it takes to do those things, I guess will be what what it is. I'm just here to talk into the mic, talk about history, and hope that you guys like it. So away we go. Let's begin. To understand the Battle of Adrianople, we need to know the history leading up to the moment. So, let us go back 15 years to June of 363, Common Era. So I know you're wondering, why are we going back 15 years to understand something that's happening in 378? Well, just listen, and I'll get us there eventually. So, in June of 363, the Emperor Julian died in a war against Sassanid Persia, its Rome's eastern neighbor. Julian was wounded at a battle where he wasn't wearing his armor, and eventually, after a couple of days of struggling, he passed away. So, this left the Roman army in the east in a very precarious position. It was now leaderless, retreating from enemy territory and being harassed by the enemy forces as they retreated. This is not a good position to be in. I can imagine you can see how trying to go home and people with stabby stab swords are trying to kill you. No one's having a good time. What the army needed was leadership. So what they decided to do was to elevate an emperor from within their own ranks. They selected a member of the Imperial Bodyguard, a man named Jovian. Jovian then began to continue the Roman retreat. Eventually, however, the Roman forces had been surrounded by the Sassanids, and Jovian was forced to sign a humiliating peace treaty. A treaty we'll go over later when it becomes relevant. The reign of Jovian is really quite brief, and it only lasts eight months. In fact, Jovian doesn't really matter in the grand sense of things here, but his death uh, in February of 364 is where we need to turn our attention to. So, in February of 364, Jovian died near Nicaea, close to the capital of the eastern portion of the empire, Constantinople. The death of Jovian again sparked the question of who should become emperor. The answer eventually turned out to be a man named Valentinian. And the reason for Valentinian's selection as emperor was due to his experience as an army officer and his central location to Nicaea. He was only a few days away from the camp that Jovian had established. So who is Valentinian and why does he matter? Valentinian is the man who would rule the western half of the Roman Empire from 364 until his death in 375. Valentinian is also famous for having his brother, who we're about to talk about, become 
the ruler of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. So we'll continue here now with Valens, and after we get into a bit of uh, the guts of his reign, we'll circle back to Valentinian and close him out today so that we have the context that we need for what's probably going to be in the next episode, the actual battle of Adrianople itself. Flavius Valens was born in 328 and was part of a family of relatively moderate means uh, amongst the Roman aristocracy. His father was a military commander. Valens was a military commander. His brother Valentinian was also a military commander. They participated in Roman society as you know minor aristocrats would do. The early part of Valens's life isn't very notable for any achievements or shining moments for himself. He lives an undistinguished life, just kind of chilling for the most part. It's not until his brother becomes emperor that Valens had any sort of uh, destiny to live out, one could say. Like I said earlier, Valens became the emperor in the eastern half of the empire. So what does that actually contain? Well, the eastern portion of the empire encompassed the modern-day Balkans, Greece, Egypt, Asia Minor, roughly modern-day Turkey, and the Levant. So think of where Syria is, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, up to there. So, like I said earlier, the border between the Romans and the Sassanids was at the Euphrates River. Not only was that part the static boundary, typically, the two empires would also feud between the Kingdom of Armenia, situated between both empires. Control over Armenia typically was what led the two great states into a war against one another. So back to the treaty that Rome had signed against the Sassanid Persians in 363. Some of the major losses in that treaty had been the loss of the Mesopotamian province and the Roman portion of Armenia. One of Valens' major priorities was to reestablish the Roman position on its eastern borders. While Valens was preparing to do that in 365, he began to assemble forces and leave the capital of Constantinople to slowly begin his gathering of troops and head off towards the eastern part of the Roman border. So here's where Valens ran into the first hiccup of his reign. You could say it's a pretty large hiccup. There was an attempted coup against his reign. So the usurper in question was a man named Procopius who was a maternal cousin to the deceased Emperor Julian, the emperor who died in Persia when we started the narrative of this podcast. Procopius was able to seize control of Constantinople in September of 365 by bribing two imperial legions that were currently in the capital. So, Procopius was able to take over the capital while Valens had left. When the news reached Valens, he was quite despondent over hearing the news of Procopius' revolt. He was down on his luck for a bit and wasn't sure what he wanted to do. Apparently, they say he was flitting back and forth between just abdicating or even committing suicide. Whatever the rumors are, eventually, Valens did fight for his throne and began his counterattack. Valens' army was not fully together as the majority of his army had already crossed into the Cilician Gates and into the Roman region of Syria. So Valens sent a force to engage Procopius' forces, but they defected and joined Procopius' side. Still not a great start to his rule. However, after a prolonged 8th month civil war, Procopius was eventually betrayed by his inner circle after two back-to-back -back defeats against Valens' forces. So, 
why did Procopius revolt and why did the soldiers agree to fight on his behalf? I want to take this moment to kind of just divert away from the main timeline and just riff about this idea of legitimacy. So Procopius wasn't a very popular figure in Roman society. There was nothing wrong with him, but he just wasn't anyone special. So if he wasn't anyone special, why did the soldiers agree to fight on his behalf? Julian had only died two years prior and was an accomplished military commander. And military victory is a surefire way to gain popularity with the soldiers and the common people of the empire. Not only was Julian himself successful, but his predecessors as well had managed to be competent administrators and military commanders. Going back to the start of Constantine the Great, Julian was actually the last Constantinian ruler. A whole generation had been raised under the reigns of the Constantinians. Procopius, as Julian's cousin, was able to tap into this wellspring of legitimacy by associating himself with the last ruling dynasty. On the other hand, Valens was a nobody before he ascended to power. Valens, like his brother, was a military officer, but he hadn't distinguished himself from his peers. Valens had only become emperor due to his brother choosing him to be the co-emperor. Procopius may have been personally unimportant, but the family history he could point toward made all the difference and allowed him, if momentarily, to fight for the top spot. Had Procopius been successful in his battles against Valens forces, he would not have been betrayed most likely and been able to continue the civil war and possibly even winning. Legitimacy can take years to build and moments to break. After Procopius had lost his battles, he was betrayed by the people around him to save their skins. Returning to the narrative, Valens had Procopius executed, but he had no time to bask in this victory. Procopius had enlisted help from a Gothic king named Ermineric, who brought with him about 30,000 soldiers. Arriving after Procopius' defeat, Ermineric promptly decided to raid in the Roman region of Thrace, the area west of Constantinople. Valens marched his troops over from the Asian territories of the empire and back into Europe, after which he was able to surround Ermineric's army forces and force the surrender. However, Ermineric was unapologetic about the actions of his army, which prompted Valens to declare war. And then in the next year, in 367, crosses over the Danube and into the Gothic heartlands and attacked the vassal state of the Vivigoths under Ermineric. The punitive Roman response did not amount to much as the Goths, unwilling to fight a pitched battle, fled deeper into their territory. Their hope was to outlast the Romans in a battle of attrition, as the deeper they went into the Gothic's territory, the longer the supply lines would be stretched and they could, you know, harass the rear guard of the Roman forces, attack their supplies. The campaign in 367 ended with no decisive action or results, and in the following year, 368, Valens was unable to cross to Gothic territory, as the Danube flooded. It would not be until 369 that Valens finally defeated the Goths and was able to force them into signing a priest treaty from a position of strength. Valens forced the Goths into battle by attacking the Gothic heartlands, pillaging and destroying many villages to get the Gothic soldiers to agitate for battle, as it was their homes being destroyed, their wives and children being slaughtered, sold into slavery, and much worse. The resulting victory for the Romans was decisive, but not the killing blow that they had hoped it to be. But it was good enough as Valens was wary of his eastern border against the Sassanids, as their Shah Shapur was always looking for a way to expand his western border, probing for weakness especially after the death of Julian six years prior. As a result, the treaty negotiations between the Romans and Goths had to be settled rather quickly. The long-term implications of this treaty did not bode well for the Romans. The short version of the treaty essentially boils down to the Goths not needing to provide a certain number of troops every year to the Romans, which was a valuable source of soldiers for the army, as naturalized citizens joining the army had begun to decrease slowly since the crisis of the 3rd century. 
The other notable mention was the severing of trade ties, which proved disastrous for the Goths, as they were forced to pay more trade taxes to trade with the empire. The next outbreak of conflict between the Romans and Persians was once again due to Armenia. After the death of Julian back in 363, the Treaty Jovian signed with the Persians to get the army home safely. Part of the concessions was ceding of political influence of Armenia to the Persians. Shapur used this to his advantage, gaining political leverage over Armenia and even arresting the Armenian king in 369 to place assassin and puppet on the throne. The Sassanids had been successful in deposing the Armenian king, but his son, known as Pap was able to escape and sought refuge with the Romans. This is like as a side note, I wonder what his like actual Armenian name was. I mean, like we get the translation of Pap, but just I don't know. Maybe maybe it was Pap, but I feel like it's just such a like translated name. It's been boiled down so many times that like anyways. Initially Valens was hesitant to help, but inevitably decided to do so. Pap arrived during Valens' war with the Goths and did not have the forces to spare to provide a large army. Pap was escorted back to Armenia with two legions, but this angered Shapur, who raised a large army and personally led it into Armenia. Pap was once again forced to flee into the mountains while Shapur destroyed city after city and the Armenian capital Artazata. The following year, 371, Valens was able to put together a force of 12 legions to combat the Persians in Armenia. Two generals under Valens' behest fought the Persians and were able to successfully defeat the Persians. Problems in Armenia did not stop, however, after Pap, newly secured on his throne, began acting out as a tyrant. The deciding moment for Valens was when Pap began to demand Roman citizens be added into his territory and even had uh, one of his bishops executed. Not long after these affronts, Pap was assassinated, allegedly, <laughs> and Valens had a new puppet king installed on the throne. Diverting away from Valens for the remainder of this podcast, I want to quickly sum up his brother Valentinian's reign uh, during their joint accession. Simultaneously in the West, Valentinian was dealing with some of his own major issues, having to deal with a lot of crap. It's no wonder, and you'll get the sense of this after, why the empire was divided between rulers. There's just too much happening at once for one person to effectively control and maintain a response to all threats at once. So having two emperors just became the logical decision. Just to quickly recap, Valentinian ascended to the throne in 364. He made his brother co-emperor with him, and then they split the empire into halves. Valentinian in the west, Valens in the east. So the first major problem Valentinian ran into was in 367, an event known as the Great Conspiracy happened on the island of Britain. And no, the Great Conspiracy is not some crazy bill that it was introduced into legislature to, you know, shake everything up. The Great Conspiracy was a coordinated effort by the Picts for modern-day Scotland, Saxons, and Franks. In 367, these groups launched a joint attack on the Roman province of Britain, nearly removing it from imperial control totally, with coordinated assaults coming at Hadrian's Wall, the south portion of the shore and the western part of the shore, respectively. These coordinated assaults killed the leadership on the island of Britain as well, and it took over a year before they were able to reassert control on the island of Britain. During this year, it was a complete slaughter on the island as many citizens who didn't live in the walled populations were victims of what happens during, you know, the events of a raid, they're killed, they're enslaved, they're sold into slavery, they're raped. Just a lot of tragic stuff that's happening to these people. I try to keep like a sense of 
understanding that these things, when we're, we talk about them, they're not just words or things to be read off. These happened to people many thousands of years ago, yes, but it's just, uh, it's important that we don't lose sight of humanity and that when we read about things that happened a long time ago, that we try not to lose some perspective. The initial Roman response was fairly anemic, and it took a couple of tries before the island was reconquered. The person who reconquered the island was a general named Count Theodosius, who is fairly important in the reign of Valentinian, and his son will become very important during the reign of Gratian, Valentinian's son. His son's name is also Theodosius, so, you know, the Romans just like to do things that way. The next major rebellion was in Roman Africa after a half Roman, half Berber named Firmus led a revolt against the governor of Africa. The governor of Africa was pretty corrupt. It's your standard stuff. He extort money from local tribes and groups and cities after they had paid their taxes. And if they wouldn't pay him their bribe money, he would de- essentially have the local bandits come to their cities, raid, destroy them as ways to show people that he was serious. Either be extorted or when you're attacked, the government won't come and protect you. You know, standard stuff. So, Valentinian once again sent his golden boy, Count Theodosius, to quell the revolt. But it took over two years to bring the province back under control. Then, later, in 373, Valentinian had to fight the coalition of German tribes of the Quadi and Alamanni on the Danube frontier. The cause of this war was the building of Roman forts over the Danube in Quadi and Alamanni territory. The Roman ignored the German groups and continued their building projects, resulting in attacks from the Quadi specifically. Valentinian saw results and so appointed a man named Marcellianus in charge of the development. Marcellianus, now in charge of the local operation, was hounded with requests from the Quadi to cease building immediately. So, he decided to fool the Quadi. Marcellianus hosted a large gathering of Quadi nobles for a dinner event as a show of peace and friendship. And in the middle of the party, once everyone was drunk in a good mood, he had the king of the Quadi kidnapped and then murdered. The Quadi were furious at this betrayal and attacked the Roman fort in their territory and then crossed over the Danube and into Roman territory. Valentinian, after hearing this, began a counterattack and pillage into the Quadi territory. After a successful punitive response by Valentinian, Pleased from the Germans as to why they had attacked had been sent to Valentinian. Telling him of Marcellianus' treachery. Valentinian glossed over the fact that the king of the Quadi had been murdered and declared that the Quadi had been wrong and continued pillaging their territory. Valentinian only stopped for the winter of 375. The Quadi once again appealed to the emperor and committed to providing the emperor with soldiers for the future, which ceased hostilities for the moment. The results of Valentinian's victory had peace envoys from the Quadi appeal to speak directly with the emperor, which in Valentinian's 11-year reign, he had thus far not done with any group of people. Eventually, Valentinian decided to hear the requests of the Quadi personally and held an audience with them. In the meeting, the Quadi had claimed that it was the Romans who had been the aggressors, first by building force in their land, then with their murder of their king. Then they began telling Valentinian, while they had agreed to the ceasefire, other groups may not, and that they were different from other tribes, you know, to a Roman, everyone's a barbarian, so. What do you mean, everyone's not going to stop attacking? But well, we signed a peace treaty. We're not the same as these other groups of people. Anyways, so, you know, that was the Roman mindset. 
However, this led to an interesting predicament. Valentinian began to get really angry, like furious. You know, imagine some dude with a vein in his forehead popping out as he screams his lungs out. That's essentially what Valentinian was doing with these envoys here. And the screaming only stopped once Valentinian collapsed and hit the ground. So, Valentinian just worked himself up into a murderous rage with the victim being himself. Yeah. He either died of a stroke or a brain aneurysm. That's what the historical records give to us. Well, that's what we interpret from the historical records. So, in 375, after an 11 year reign, Valentinian I was dead. Now, who's going to rule in the West? Well, that's a good question, because Valentinian had two children. He had a son named Gratian, at this point only 16 years old, however, had been crowned co-emperor with his father. He also had a three-year-old child. So, he's off the table. Right? Wrong. His son Gratian was acclaimed emperor, and his brother Valentinian II was also acclaimed emperor. So these two now split the already split empire into thirds, with Valens in the east, Gratian in Italy, and his brother having Spain, Egypt. It's a bit of a mess. I'll find a map for you guys to kind of see what the breakdown looked like. So, why did Valentinian II get crowned emperor as well? The politics of Rome are always a bit tricky, but the main breakdown is this. Gratian was born before Valentinian became emperor. Valentinian II, however, was born once his father was emperor. So, that gives him a status known as born in the purple. Born in the purple essentially means that you are born when your father is already emperor. Not that you were your father's son or daughter before they became emperor. So it's a post-ruler designation for any children that the ruler may have afterwards. This is kind of a common thing amongst other societies and dynasties, not just uh, towards Rome, but other other medieval monarchies, ancient monarchies, what have you. So, to wrap things up, here's where we are. It's 375. Valentinian has just died. His two sons are now co-ruling in the western half of the empire. Valens is in the east, now the senior emperor. And we are three years away from Valens' date with destiny on the battlefields of Adrianople. So, our next episode, we will get into the fateful battle itself. We'll talk about the lead up to it, the actual battle itself, and I think uh, it'll be pretty exciting. So, thank you for listening to my first ever podcast episode. It means a lot. Didn't realize how much work this would be uh, when I did it. So, for all the people who've been waiting very patiently for me to drop this podcast episode a special thank you to you all as well to everyone who will pass upon this podcast i hope that you enjoy it i hope that you got this far i hope that you stick around and we'll see you around for the next episode of pinpoint history let's get it